Um, welcome to the Law School. My name is Professor Fanula Nielain. I am the Faculty Director of the Human Rights Centre and I'm here just to briefly say hello, welcome you all and uh, to, to say what a real privilege it is uh, to be here to celebrate 30 years of our faculty's Human Rights Centre. Uh, it's a, an occasion to celebrate our teaching and our research contributions to the Law School. It's an occasion to celebrate the Human Rights Center's contributions to the strengthening of international human rights law. It's an occasion to celebrate and support our partnerships with local and international uh, NGOs. And it's also an occasion to celebrate the enrichment and the purpose that we have given to, to the legal studies and careers of innumerable students. We have so much to be proud of, and it is a really great day to celebrate all of that as we celebrate 30 years of the Human Rights Center and 70 years in just a couple of days of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. I want to acknowledge uh, the large shoes I am filling. Uh, David Weisbrod uh, was the uh, visionary who created the Human Rights Center, who imagined a university human rights center 30 years ago. Uh, he inspired what we have today and he inspired innumerable centers around the country where other schools tried to emulate what we were doing in Minnesota. Uh, we're joined today by many of the over 600 students who've been recipients of Human Rights Fellowship, so a number of the donors who've helped make that happen. Uh, we're celebrating our Human Rights Library, and uh, I was told by Amanda Lyons, our executive director, over lunch today that we continue to have somewhere in the region of 250,000 hits per month on that center's uh, website. Um, and we're really here to uh, acknowledge the work that's been done, but also to look forward to the next 30 years. We live in extraordinarily testing times for human rights. And never has the work of the Human Rights Center and the work of the law school been more relevant, more vibrant, and more um, strengthened and resilient in the work that we have to do ahead. So thank you all. It's now my pleasure to introduce, introduce Dean Jenkins, one of our, our major supporters, the, the person who support, supports us most in the building. Uh, and he's going to say a few words before we have our speaker uh, speak this evening. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to warmly welcome everyone to this year's Keller Lecture. Uh, first, before I do that, though, on this occasion, I do want to offer my sincere congratulations to the Human Rights Center on its glorious 30th anniversary. Um, and that includes all staff and faculty and students and partners, past and present, uh, and a sincere thanks to its donors and supporters, and a hearty congratulations to its past and current leaders, um, particularly uh, founding director and professor emeritus David Weisbrod, uh, current faculty director Fanula Nealane, and current executive director, Amanda Lyons, class of 09. We are so thankful, we are so proud of your work and your legacy. So please join me in giving them all a big round of applause. Now I wanna tell you a little bit about our Keller Distinguished Lecture Series and introduce you to our guest speaker today, Michael Posner. Uh, the late Curtis B. Keller, class of 1940, established the Horatio Ellsworth Keller Distinguished Visitors Program in memory of his father. Uh, in keeping with his father's interest, uh, Curtis uh, Keller's desire was to support an interdisciplinary lecture series at the law school that would connect emerging issues in the law with other disciplines, such as art, literature, science, and public policy. And among those who have delivered the Keller Lecture are the late Michael Hyman, then secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, Mary Robinson, professor, uh, former president of Ireland, and Scott Turow, the award-winning author. Um, ultimately, this distinguished lecture exists to inspire and 
to stimulate. And this year we are honored to have a leading lawyer and diplomat with us to do just that. The students here know that I talk a lot about what it means to be a lawyer leader, um, about what I think it means for them to take the mantle of leadership and carry it forward into the next generation, to understand what a career of a lawyer leader looks like, to see how a lawyer can lead and serve on issues of importance. And Michael Posner offers a brilliant case study of those things. Throughout his storied career, he has been a prominent voice in support of human rights and an advocate for people who need protections. A graduate of the University of Michigan and the University of California at Berkeley School of Law, he was a lawyer with Chicago's Sonnenschein Nath Firm, which is now Denton's. And from 1978 to 2009, he led Human Rights First, formerly known as the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, um, one of the most preeminent international human rights organizations in the world. In that role, he helped promote the passage of the Refugee Act of 1980, the Torture Victim Protection Act of 1992, and the Rome Statute, the, the treaty that established the International Criminal Court. In 2009, Posner moved from being an activist and advocate to helping directly determine and implement American policy when he was tapped by the Obama administration to serve as the Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. In that position, he was a key negotiator in the US-China Human Rights Dialogue, led efforts to support internet freedom across the globe, and engaged in strategic initiatives that linked national security with economic, social, and political rights. Since 2013, Assistant Secretary Posner has been Professor Posner. Uh, he joined the faculty at NYU, uh, particularly at Stern School of Business as the Jerome Kohlberg Professor of Ethics and Finance, where he is also the director of their Center for Business in Human Rights. It's the first ever human rights center at a business school. In a world in which non-state actors are playing an increasingly uh, important role in world affairs, this is an important and I think overdue development. After all, many large global corporations have greater market capitalization than the GDP of many uh, small countries and big corporations like ExxonMobil or Apple or to Toyota wield as much influence as any government in some nations. Posner is recognized throughout the human rights world as a leader and expert in advancing rights-based approaches to national security, challenging the practice of torture, combating discrimination, promoting refugee protection, and considering human rights in manufacturing supply chains. Please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Posner. Thank you, uh, Dean Jenkins, for those really kind words. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, it is uh, a really an honor to be back at the University of Minnesota Law School. Uh, the immediate occasion, as Finn said, is both a celebration of the 30th anniversary of the uh, Center for uh, Human Rights Center, but also the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration. I'm going to say more about that in a moment. But I'm really thrilled to be back here in the Midwest. Uh, I am uh, always going to call this part of the country home. I grew up in Chicago. Uh, I went to school at the University of Michigan. I got my first job as a lawyer uh, in Chicago with a law firm. And at a time when our country and our world really feels like it's coming a bit unglued, um, it really is refreshing and wonderful to be in a state and at a university with such a great tradition of practical idealism and principled political leadership. In preparing for this talk, I went back and looked at a couple of things about some great Minnesotans. And I started out by looking at a little bit of the history of uh, Hubert Humphrey, mayor of Minneapolis in the 40s. He was a big a promoter of civil rights protections and employment. And then I found this wonderful 
anecdote about him in 1948 at the Democratic Convention. There was an effort to add a civil rights plank into the Democratic uh, Party's con uh, platform. And there were a number of Southern Democrats. At that time, most Southern senators and politicians were so part of the Democratic Party. And they argued that talking about civil rights was going to undermine states' rights. And so here's what Hubert Humphrey said in 1948. He said, to those who say we are rushing this issue of civil rights, I say we are 172 years too late. To those who say civil rights programs are an infringement of states' rights, I say the time has arrived in America for the Democratic Party to get out of the shadow of states' rights and walk forthrightly into the bright sunlight of human rights. Um, and so Hubert Humphrey uh, led the way. Walter Mondale, for whom this school is named, was another great progressive human rights voice as the uh, state attorney general here in Minnesota, he led an effort to uh, get a number of state attorneys general um, to file an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief, in a very uh, famous case, Gideon versus Wainwright, which provided for the first time uh, legal, guaranteed legal representation uh, in criminal cases. Senator Mondale also was a principal sponsor of the Fair Housing Act of 1966. And the tradition goes on. Senator Wellstone in the 90s uh, carried on this tradition uh, advocating for workers, for immigrants, for victims of domestic violence. And today, Senator Klobuchar and others are carrying on that tradition. I want to say a special word about another Minnesotan who had a big impact in my life, and that's the former mayor, former Congressman Don Fraser. He really put human rights on the map in Congress and in 1975 convened the first ever congressional hearings looking at the issue of international human rights. Uh, nobody else was talking about it, but Don Fraser understood the importance of this issue. Um, his hearings led to the adoption of what was called the Fraser Amendment to the Foreign Assistance Act, which for the first time linked security assistance uh, to human rights. If a country was a gross violator of human rights, said the Fraser Amendment, they weren't eligible for military security assistance. Um, that provision also created an, an imperative for the State Department, which is none too eager, um, to begin compiling an annual report on human rights conditions around the world. How could Congress decide who was violating human rights without the facts? And so the Human Rights Report was created, and out of that came the creation of the Bureau, now called Democracy, Rights, and Labor, which I was proud uh, to serve as the director of, as the Assistant Secretary from 2009 to 13. So Don Fraser is a hero to me, somebody who's really made an enormous difference in our country and in the world. I'm now, uh, uh, working in a broader set of issues relating, as, uh, as the dean said, to business and human rights. I'm not going to say anything about that here, but it is right, as he said, that we have, um, I think, moved to a place where we recognize that not only states have obligations, governments have obligations, but in a world where big global companies are increasingly powerful and important, um, their role needs to be looked at. It's a different conversation in the sense of they have to be brought into the discussion about what rights, how do they go about abiding by them. But it's an important thing. And we say we're pro-company, but with high standards. We're both pushing companies and trying to help them to figure out how to go there. I want to come back to Don Fraser. His leadership in this community was echoed by the creation of a number of non-governmental organizations, wonderful groups, wonderful activists, which this community has always been uh, so emblematic of. Advocates for Human Rights, now led by Robin Phillips, the Center for the Victims of Torture, uh, led by Cor Kurt Gehring. Uh, these are organizations that not only energize this community, but they help to define the human rights landscape yeah, around this country and in the world. And then finally, this law school. Uh, as the dean said, uh, David Weisbrot, who is an old friend and, and somebody I admire tremendously, have really led the way in creating this Center for Human Rights and creating this link between academic um, uh, 
scholarship and research and teaching and advocacy. David really led the way with this. Coming here in 1975, creating the center 30 years ago, David was a mainstay in helping to build the human rights advocacy community, long active with organizations like Amnesty International. He also was the leader in sort of defining the link with the United Nations and the international community. And as, as, as uh, Finn mentioned, uh, also in providing the academic uh, and activist support by creating an online library, which really led the way, way ahead of his time. So David, I salute you. You really have been an enormous role model for so many. In the early, nine, in the early 1980s, I was asked to come up to Yale Law School to help set up a law clinic there. And we look to Minnesota and what you did here. It's, very, it's a very important part of this school and a, an important part of the history of the human rights movement in this country. Thank you for all that you've done. The Human Rights Center continues on today as we celebrate it, directed at an academic level by, by Professor Nielon and by uh, uh, Amanda Lyons, who's the executive director. Um, uh, I've known Finn for many years. We had the privilege of teaching together uh, at Columbia Law School in the 1990s. We also were um, side by side in the struggle for human rights in Northern Ireland in the period before, during, and after the Good Friday Agreement, which is an amazing, we are talking at lunch about the need to find models of where human rights advocacy pays off. And boy, oh boy, I think of my first days in walking the streets of Belfast with the guns drawn, the soldiers on the street, uh, and where it is today, it really is a credit to Finn and the advocates within Northern Ireland who had a real smart sense of how to use a political moment, uh, a peace agreement and uh, uh, George Mitchell's efforts there uh, to in, infuse human rights at the center of that agreement. If the Northern Ireland Good Friday Agreement stands for anything, it's you can't have peace without addressing the human rights issues. And people like Finn were very much in the middle of that and, and continues to be involved uh, as she is here as both a teacher and also somebody involved with the United Nations dealing with issues of national security and terrorism. I also wanna just pay a special tribute to Barb Fry, who's been a great part of this community for so long, both as an advocate with Minnesota Advocates, uh, here at the law school, and now really promoting a uh, 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 approach that cuts across different uh, 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 parts of the school, both with undergraduates, the Humphrey School, and the law school. So this is a very special place. You all don't realize it, but the, every place is not like Minneapolis or Minnesota. So hold on to it. It's really important what you've done and what you continue to do. As we celebrate the 30th anniversary here, let's also look out at what's happening in the world and this celebration recognition of the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The UN was founded, as, as everybody knows, immediately after World War II, a disaster for our world. 65 million people were killed. Um, we had the Holocaust, 6 million Jews and hundreds of thousands of others killed because of their religious belief or their um, uh, sexual preference or their ethnicity. Um, the world recognized, the framers of the UN recognized the importance of human rights. The UN really is built on three pillars. One is security, it's a collective security. They built the Security Council around the notion we ought to keep governments from fighting with each other. Second is development. What Franklin Roosevelt said, you know, necessitous men are the things in which revolutions are, are built. And so the notion was to create the World Bank and UN development program, et cetera. The third leg of the stool was human rights. From the outset, in the charter, the notion was that human rights was an essential element of maintaining peace, stability, and security in our world. And the UN was smart enough to identify a spectacular leader, Eleanor Roosevelt, the widow of FDR, who became the first chair of the Commission on Human Rights. Over two years, she was the main driving force of this Universal Declaration. And she did it in a way that in 1948 in December, 70 years ago, almost in a few weeks, uh, the, the Universal Declaration passed 48 to nothing with eight abstentions. She called it 
a Magna Carta for all mankind. I think it's the most important document of the 20th century. Universal Declaration broke new ground in two ways. One, it, it universalized the notion of rights. What do I mean by that? What it said was that we all have rights by virtue of our humanity. We don't wait for a government to give it to us. Every one of us, every human being on this planet is entitled to certain basic protections. That broke new grounds. The second thing it did was to internationalize rights. It said that these are no longer the province or the privilege of states. It's not just for your government to tell you what rights you're entitled to. There is a collective understanding among states that states that go below that minimum threshold, states that are involved in torture, that are involved in political killing, those states are no longer immune from international criticism. It's now the subject of diplomacy. It was my job for almost four years in the State Department to be the person in the US government saying, this is what matters to us as a matter of policy, diplomacy. This is not just us. It's a collective responsibility of states. Now, to be sure, the implementation of that wonderful document is much harder than the words. And in the decades that followed, diplomats have taken a lot of energy to create some legal documents, including treaties on civil and political rights, on economic social rights, rights of women, rights against racial discrimination, uh, protection of children. They've also set up a series of uh, efforts, now a UN Human Rights Council, which succeeded the Commission on Human Rights, and a range of special experts, again, Finn, is a great representative of that, being the special rapporteur for the last year on counterterrorism and human rights. But you may ask, and a lot of people say, what difference does all this make in real people's lives? Given the unsettled state of our country and what's happening around the world, I think cynics will say, well, look, not much is going on. Uh, look at all the things that are happening in places like Yemen or Syria. Uh, look at what's happening to the Rohingya. In, in, in Burma, in Myanmar. So I'm an optimist by nature. Um, I always think the glass is half full, but I also live in a world where data and facts matter. And I think the facts point to the progress we've made over the last 30 years. When David and uh, Weisbrot and I were graduating, we both went to University of California at Berkeley. He graduated a few years before me, but not many. Um, we, uh, we looked around the world, and almost every government in Latin America was run by a military. Uh, we looked around the world, and South Africans were living under apartheid, a government-sanctioned racial discrimination. We looked to Northern Ireland, where a society was engulfed in violence, the troubles, where two religious groups were at each other's throat. We looked at the tens of millions of people looking, living under a repressive regime in the Soviet Union, including many tens of thousands who were detained in the brutal gulags. And in places like Uganda, where I did some early work, Cambodia, we saw governments, dictatorial leaders, engaged in mass violence and even genocide. When I look at the um, way in which we deal with these issues today, I see a real difference. Today, with the exception of North Korea, there isn't a country on earth where there are no indigenous human rights advocates raising these issues. Um, in the 70s, when I looked at Idi Amin's Uganda, there wasn't a single human rights group in Uganda. In fact, there wasn't a single human rights group in sub-Saharan Africa outside of South Africa and what was then Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. Many of these people today work in very dangerous environments. God knows a lot of governments are trying to snuff them out, but they continue to advocate for the most vulnerable people in their societies. Over the last 40 years, there's really been a sea change in the international, local, and global response to human rights abuses in which these activists have played a crucial part. My response to the cynics who say, the, look at Yemen, look at Syria, look at the Rohingya, is that working on human rights is not a sport for the short-winded. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint, and perhaps it's even an ultra-marathon with no clear finish line. But the repetition of tragic abuses should motivate us to do more, not wave the white flag of despair. Which brings me to my final topic, which is what do we do now as 
we, in trying to continue the advance of human rights in the face of the current retreat of US leadership in the world, here I wanna make three simple points. First, we must continue to make the case that America's values and commitment to human rights and democracy also advances our other national interest. Early in his brief and I would say unsuccessful tenure as Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson gave a kind of bizarre speech to the uh, foreign service officers gathered in the Atchison uh, room in the State Department, in which he said, we have our interests, which are economic and security, and we have our values. And he went on to say in these words, which I still marvel at, uh, he said, our values create obstacles to our ability to advance our national security, our economic interests. Um, people almost, there was almost a gasp in the room as, as people heard him saying this. It's wrong on several levels. It assumes mistakenly that things like freedom, dignity, and the prohibition and torture against torture are American values alone. These are global uh, standards. These are global uh, 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 standards right now. People who are on the receiving end of torture can tell you, and everyone will tell you, that they uh, have a, uh, an international, they have a, an imperative not to be uh, abused by their own leaders. Their authoritarian leaders may something else, say something else, but the people who are in the midst of this understand the universality of human rights norms. It's also the case that democratic rights respecting states are this country's closest allies. They're our best trading partners and they're the strongest allies in our fight against global terrorism. Second, we must push back against the president's rejection of an international legal order that the United States has led in promoting and promoted over the last 70 years. The United States is the largest, the biggest, the most important beneficiary of the post-World War II economic political order. Um, we help create the institutions like the UN, like the World Bank, the Bretton Woods Agreements. We help promote organizations like the UN High Commissioner's Office for Refugees, the Refugee Agency. We help promote the humanitarian standards of the Red Cross. Um, we have been at the center of that in a way that's both helped the world and helped our own security, stability, and prosperity. When dealing with human rights, climate change, national security, or governance, um, the US uh, policy today based on America first is both counterproductive and wrong. It fails to address these global challenges, and in the end, as I say, it undermines our own best interests. My friend and very, former colleague in the State Department, Harold Coe, who's now the, who was the dean, is now a professor at Yale Law School, has just published a book entitled The Trump Administration in International Law. He describes this retreat in, in the following ways. He says, wherever possible, the administration's approach is to disengage from globalism, undermine international institution, institutions, and resign from global leadership. Professor Coe's broader thesis is that the United States has played a central role in developing what he calls the transnational legal order, which has made us and others stronger. This order deserves our support, and groups like the University of Minnesota Center on Human Rights need to be part of that fight. We're fighting for the soul of American policy, American foreign policy, and domestic policy based on law, rule of law, and our values. My final observation relates to the treatment of refugees and asylum seekers, something that I've been involved with for a long time. There are now more than 65 million people in the world who are either displaced by armed conflicts or breakdowns in order in their societies. Since World War II, the United States has been the singular leader on refugee protection. Uh, in inviting in, supporting, protecting literally millions of people who fled from Hungary, from Cuba, from Indochina, Soviet Jews and the like. Our country has offered generous support to the UN Refugee Agency uh, that leads this international effort. Uh, what we have now is an administration that is trying to undermine and really turn its back on that leadership. Uh, last year, which ended, uh, last physical year, which ended the end of September, we took only 22,000 refugees from the whole world. We took less than 500 from six countries, 
Syria, Iran, Yemen, Sudan, South Sudan, and Somalia were among the most desperate people are fleeing persecution. Um, by contrast, two years ago, we took 84,000 refugees. That's four times as many. During the same period, at the same time, the president proclaimed last week as he was flying out of town that we were going to now basically shut down the southern border and say that even if people were eligible to apply for asylum, had the qualification having fled persecution and having a fear of being returned to persecution, if they didn't come through a designated uh, entry point on the southern border, they were forever barred from applying. I think it's illegal, it's certainly wrong, and it again flies in the face of our traditions, the context of what Emma Lazarus called uh, a country uh, who, uh, who, where huddled masses yearn to breathe free. So I conclude by saying as we can commemorate the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration, the 30th anniversary of the Center for Human Rights here, we must remember and celebrate both how much we've accomplished, we've accomplished a lot, but also double down in understanding the great challenges that remain and especially right now when these values are being challenged. We have to return to the words and the spirit of Hubert Humphrey. Our task now is to walk forthrightly in the bright sunshine of human rights. Thank you. All right, I'm eager to hear your questions. You've heard enough from me. So just to say, we are live streaming, and because we are, I'm going to ask you to shout out your questions, I'm actually going to be the interpreter. I'm going to restate the questions so that our live feed can pick them up. So there are lots of my students in the room, so I'm watching you all. <laughs> Let's have some questions, if there are any. Yes, at the back. So just to, for the for the feed, um, the comment was that uh, our president, Mr. Trump, is a counterforce to human rights, and uh, asking Professor Posner to reflect on how we should understand that counterforce, what should we learn from it, and how do we respond to it? Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to make a confession. I didn't vote for the president. Uh, 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 I also would say that there is some aspect of his personality, the way he makes decisions, that's probably better uh, answered by somebody in the psychological, psychiatric field. Um, there's clearly some things that are just irrational, at least to me. I think there's an important thing that's going on, though, that is more to the point of your question, which is that we are living in an uh, insecure time where lots of people in our own society feel left behind. Um, a lot of what uh, uh, resonated, a lot of what allowed the president to be elected was both fear and anger. Uh, fear from people who rightly understand that the world's not the same, they've lost their job, they have economic insecurity. Uh, anger that there's a greater uh, a disparity between rich and poor, a sense that the system isn't working for them. So as much as I think his prescriptions are not real or honest, I think the uh, things that underlie a lot of the support that he got are things that we ignore at our own peril. Um, those, these are, this is a very challenging time for this country. We have very, very rich people who've done incredibly well. We have a lot of people who've been left behind. And we've got to find a way, A, to work better together across party lines, but we've also got to find ways to address the changes in the workplace. They're, they're not, it's not so simple. I don't think it's as simple as, you know, the Trans-Pacific Partnership stole jobs. I think it is more, there, there's profound things going on in our society economically, and I think it's imperative for Democrats and Republicans to be very attentive to those changes and try in an honest way to deal with them. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Yuval Harari, the historian, uh, he talks about a future where humans uh, continue to lose economic value compared with artificial intelligence, robots, things like that, as a potential threat to human rights. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, your comment on that at all? 
So the question really asks Professor Posner to um, reflect on the challenges, particularly through artificial intelligence and other kinds of technological advances mm -hmm. to the protection and promotion of human rights. So again, <clears throat> we could spend uh, at least another hour on that subject. It's a big subject. You know, I, I, I've done a lot of work with the uh, technology firms, the Google, Facebook kinds of firms. I also was involved last year in an effort to look at the relationship of artificial intelligence to discrimination. Um, but I would start by answering your question saying this. A lot of what's happening in terms of what's been called the fourth industrial revolution, the way in which technology is changing the way we live and work, a lot of it is fantastic. It's opened up education, uh, it's opened up trade, it's opened up innovation, it's opened up political discourse. So I, I start by saying it is a fact that we're living in a, in a world now where technology is playing an increasing role. It's like, you know, the sun is going to come out tomorrow. We, we live with it, and we, we should seize on the benefits. There are risks associated with it, and your question poses one set of risks. One is the nature of work. Automation is going to mean that there are not going to be truck drivers in the numbers we have them in 10 years. So what do you do about that? You need to, A, analyze it, understand that that's a feature of the new economy, and then you have to figure out where there are new opportunities and how do you take advantage of it. This is becoming more a service economy than a manufacturing economy. Nature of agriculture is changing. So there's lots of things going on here that I think we need to be open to the fact it's changing. There's some good things that come out of technology. There's also an underside. And we need to be, as we celebrate again the value of it, we've got to be much more attentive and more strategic and more... I would say thoughtful in really taking a look at where the, the risks and how do we overcome those risks. Yes, go. So Taylor's question is really, how do we engage the broader public in uh, securing human rights, particularly given your comments about the great insecurities that people are feeling at this moment? We're talking at lunch, actually, about <clears throat> um, the, I would say, the failure or the weakness of the human rights community, human rights activists, including me, to um, celebrate or to articulate in clear, understandable terms, the wins we've had, the value we've achieved. I mentioned the Northern Ireland example. It's hard to walk the streets of Belfast or Derry and not understand it's a very different place than it was 25 years ago. Most Americans, that's an abstraction. Um, it's hard, uh, I think, also to understand, even in terms of the things that people are anxious about, how much human rights makes a difference. Um, we were traumatized 20 years ago by the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Um, we have not had other attacks of that nature, and in some respects we have been stronger globally because we have been smarter about dealing with extreme violence coming from you know, uh, violent extremist groups. Part of that is a human rights response. We understand that all of the armies in the world are not going to reduce that threat without a, a corresponding attention to what's alienating people, what's causing them to take up violence in the way that they do. So I think there are two things. We need to be clear about the places where what we are doing and what we have done has made a difference. We need to celebrate that and amplify it to people who say, what does this matter? And secondly, we have to make real arguments that people in their lives benefit from a rule-based, law-based, human rights-based system, which makes them more secure and makes their lives better. Uh, sure. We have, yes, go ahead. Really? 
relationship with North Korea, our uh, response or action with North Korea as the United States. The second part of that is that there's th about 300,000 refugees in North Korea living in China right now. Mm -hmm. They're living underground because China's not living up to their human rights agreements as well. And it's causing extreme trauma and tragedy for North yeah. Korean refugees in China. So any thoughts about the relationship with China? So our question really picks up on Professor Posner's comment about North Korea really being the last completely closed society in the world and asks him to reflect, first of all, on his own experience of working as a diplomat in the context of North Korea, insights into North Korea, and then secondly, to address the per precarious position of North Korean refugees or persons who have left the regime in China, many of whom are living underground and largely invisible. So a couple of things to that. <clears throat> One, the comment about North Korea that I made a few minutes ago is, I think, related to what I think we ought to be doing and thinking about North Korea. Uh, I said it's the only country in the world that I'm aware of that really has no indigenous human rights movement. Um, even the Gulf states where I would have said, you know, 10 years ago, there's hardly anybody in UAE or Saudi there are people now raising women's issues, rights issues. The isolation of North Korea is part of its problem. And that doesn't mean we ought to be uh, Pollyanna about what's going on there. I think there is still a huge threat posed by a pr pretty crazy government that's been isolated for a long time and it, that's been unbelievably brutal to its own people. So let's have a clear-eyed sense of what we're up against. It's, our, it's again, it's very hard to follow what goes on in the Trump administration. You know, for one minute, we're, they're doing great, and then it's a threat, and now I think the president says it's, the threat is over. I don't think the threat is over. I think it's actually a very dangerous, dangerous and isolated regime that only knows that its one card is that they have nuclear capacity. So we should not take our eye off that ball. Having said that, the less isolated they are, the more likely they're going to change. And so I think we've got to, at the same time, try to figure out what are the ways to open up the space for people within North Korea to understand how utterly isolated and bizarre their existence is. With regard to the Chinese, the Chinese have, as you say, uh, accepted or um, been the recipients of several hundred thousand Koreans. They're not treated well. Some of them are pushed back. As you say, they live in the shadows. Uh, that takes me to a bigger question about how we deal with human rights in China. And I think we have been uh, asleep at the switch in understanding when America stops leading and engaging globally, there's a vacuum. And what we see at the UN and in every international institution is the Chinese rushing in with a value neutral or value free kind of diplomacy that says that human rights and democracy doesn't matter. That's a big threat to us and it's a threat to our world. And so I think in a larger sense, we need to be calling out the Chinese when they mistreat North Koreans, but we also need in a daily basis to be thinking whether it's again, government or business, how do we deal with a Chinese government that's increasingly um, anti-human rights, that's sh shutting down the space for people to raise these issues internally and globally is offering Africa, other parts of the world, hey, we'll give you economic support cost-free. You don't have to worry about that human rights stuff. That's initially appealing. Um, it's absolutely the wrong thing. And our abdicating leadership, I think, does a real disservice to human rights in those places as well. I'm conscious that all the questions have come from here, so I'm going to start looking over to this side of the room. Yes, go ahead. So let me just repeat. The question is really, given the hegemonic position of the U.S., how does the U.S. address international human rights concerns when there are a myriad of domestic human rights and pressing human rights challenges? So I'd say a couple of things to that. <clears throat> one is, um, I don't think one focusing on one precludes the other. We need to do both. 
Um, Secretary Clinton would always say, and I, I would say when I was in government, um, we need to lead by example. One of the things we did, the UN created something called Universal Periodic Review, where every government has to do their own kind of self-report card. A lot of governments, you know, call it in, they do, do it by the numbers. We organized 19 uh, uh, consultations around the country. We had 1,000 people come, advocates uh, for gay rights, for prison reform, for racial d discrimination on national security. Uh, we, I forced, I was not the most popular person in the government, I forced people from the federal agencies to show up at those things and listen. And we regulated, we, we, and I said to every agency, we had 30 agencies involved, um, you have to change one thing because of this process. About half of them did it. But that's better than nothing. Uh, and it is leading by example in the sense that we actually took the process seriously. We have huge challenges in this society. We've got to be attentive to them. Some of them are getting worse. Um, and those are things that we need to double down on and get right. But at the same time, uh, as we're leading by example and trying to address those things, we shouldn't be shy about the values that are central to this country and, again, that are universal values. When the United States doesn't lead on these issues, there is a giant hole, there's a giant gap, and we need to be mindful of what's happening in places like Egypt or Myanmar or the Philippines. All over the world, things are happening that are not good, and the absence of U.S. strong U.S. leadership on human rights is having a cost. Yes, right here. Question from Sam is what is the what has been successful in integrating human rights values into corporate settings? So this is what I do in my day job, um, and uh, <clears throat> what we find is that there's, um, I would say, a growing public attention to how corporations, especially global corporations, are operating. So we've moved out of the place where you know 30 or 40 years ago a big global corporation would source, you know, uh, manufactured goods or farm, you know, uh, crops or whatever, uh, m minerals somewhere far away in the world and nobody would know about it. We live in, companies live in a, in a global fishbowl now. Again, the internet, another value of new technology and communications, people immediately know what's going on out there. I think of a company like Barrick Mining that was operating in Papua New Guinea five hours away from wherever you could find an airplane. And they just assume nobody is going to know what's going on in that gold mine. Well, somebody showed up with a, you know, a cell phone and they put it online and all of a sudden there's 500 people standing outside their headquarters in Toronto. And so companies are now mindful of the fact that these are now globally important issues and they affect them. So one side of what motivates companies is brand reputation. They don't want to be Barrick Mining. And by the way, Barrick has taken that negative experience and done some very useful things. But companies are mindful of the fact they don't want the spotlight on them, and so they're trying to figure out what do we do to mitigate the risk. The other side, which is to me more interesting, is the affirmative side. And I deal a lot with companies that are really trying to do the right thing, and what they tell me is that even though investors are telling them to you know, maximize quarterly returns, they're trying to build a culture in their companies where young people want to come and work for them. They feel proud to work for them. They want to work in a place where they have lines of suppliers that are reliable, where there isn't turnover, where there's high quality. There are a range of affirmative things that go with being a good company. So I think it's some combination of avoid the negative, accentuate the positive. But I'm quite optimistic, actually, that the world is moving. I said at a lunch I did here 
millennials and women are now a bigger part of our economy. Women are going to control individually more than men within a few years as individual investors. Millennials will control $30 trillion in the next 20 years. Every survey shows women and millennials care twice as much about issues of environment, human rights, labor, as old white guys like us. <laughs> Andy. Yes, um, I had a question that's directly connected to Sam's, which is how do we get these big multinational corporations that have so much power and so many resources to go to the next level which is not only incorporating human rights, but in working in the movement towards human rights, which is engaged to changing what the climate is now. So I'm just going to ask Andy, one of our alumni, uh, questions and a, a human rights advocate in the community in her own right. Um, uh, just to focus on this question of how do we get corporations to internalize these values? How do we move mm -hmm. that needle? So a lot of what we're doing focuses on um, how big companies make money. What's their business model? And I think that's the place to start. I'm less interested, although I think it's noble and wonderful that a lot of big companies have you know, foundations, they do charitable work, they work in the community. That's all fine, but that's on top of what they have to do, what I think they have to do. They have to look at their business model What's their main way of making money? And what are the human rights challenges that are inherent in that system? And the way then you start to have a conversation is, this should be a business driver. And what companies know, I'm, I'm in a business school, I see it all the time, Company, everything that's a business driver, there's a standard, there's a metric, there's a way of evaluating it. People's jobs depend on meeting the metric. And so it's called Parsons' Law. Everything which is measured improves. Everything which is measured and becomes public improves exponentially. We need to go from having broad conversation about what business does to look at every industry. What are the human rights challenges affecting the tech sector or manufacturing or the extractives? What are the three, five, eight things that really matter? Let's have a standard. Let's set some metrics. Let's evaluate it. Companies need to work together in a particular industry. We're just at the beginning of this, and I could maybe afterwards give you some examples where we're starting to see this work. Peril Industry has been out front on this, actually. Um, but it, because they've gotten a lot of bad publicity, they've sort of rallied around it. But I think there's really room for businesses to take this as a business uh, priority and, and achieve a lot, a lot more than we're seeing now. Yes, Sam. Sam. <laughs> Sam wants to know, uh, one of our 2L students wants to know when, Mike, you're going to run for presidency. I, I get to run your campaign, by the way. <laughs> We're old friends. You owe me. <laughs> I think I'll pass on that question. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, go. <laughs> So the question really focuses on the distinction, at what sounded like a distinction, I don't think it was, but a distinction between millennials and uh, interests of millennials and women around particular issues and really asks you to focus on this question of uh, other generations of rights, particularly environmental rights. How does the Universal Declaration speak to those rights and what, what do you see uh, happening in that space? Yeah, <clears throat> so I'm glad you asked that question. I, <clears throat> I put the two together um, wearing a kind of investor lens because the investment community has now discovered what they call ESG, which is environmental, social, and governance. It's really E and S because G, good governance, that's what corporate lawyers do. Every company understands they have to have good governance. So the two new 
relatively new additions to the conversation are environment and social. Social is a bit ill-defined, but it includes human rights and labor. Uh, I agree with entirely the thrust of your question. There's a big overlap between the environmental agenda and the human rights agenda. They're not entirely the same, but there are plenty of places. You know, the right to health has all kinds of environmental consequences. Bad environmental practices have all kinds of kind of consequences for health. Um, it's also true that a lot of environmental degradation occurs in poor neighborhoods, in among people who don't have the ability to uh, advocate for themselves, and their things are not dumped, uh, you know, in uh, Scarsdale, New York, or Edina. They're dumped in poor neighborhoods in the South or in Sierra Leone. So we've got to, I think, do a lot more actually in terms of advocacy to bring the environmental and the, uh, the human rights together because we have a lot to give each other and a lot to help each other with. We have time for like two more questions. Professor Miley, Steve Miley. Just the, uh, the question is really to respond to the critique made by Moyne and others that the Universal Declaration focuses overly on individual rights, insufficiently on collective rights, and how would you respond to that? You know, <clears throat> what's interesting about the Universal Declaration, again, Eleanor Roosevelt was the kind of prime mover coming from the United States, and she fought very hard. I, I spent years ago when I started working at Human Rights First, I spent a couple of weeks up in Hyde Park, New York, reading through Eleanor Roosevelt's correspondence with the State Department. And there were a lot of people in the State Department who said, took a very American constitutional view and said human rights is the right to free speech, it's the right to due process, it's all of the things that we have in the Constitution. And she pushed back very hard on that and ultimately prevailed in making the Universal Declaration, not only about those civil and political rights that we proudly have as in our constitutional history, but also right to health, right to housing, right to you know the, the kinds of things you're talking about. So the document passed, although the Russians, the Soviets abstained, and then they went to draft to treat a treaty and they couldn't do it and it was caught in the Cold War. The Russians, the Soviets, and others said, you know, human rights begin after breakfast. This is all about collective rights. Free, we'll have free speech after we have, you know, all the economic things. That's the Lee Kuan Yew approach in Singapore. And he, the Singaporeans still say they're a developing state. I dare anybody to go to Singapore and, <laughs> and, and say that. Um, and we took the opposite view. We didn't, we still haven't ratified the covenant on economic and social rights, kind of, you know, one of very few countries to do so. So I think it's a false dichotomy. I think absolutely you need to be aware of collective security, collective well-being. Development is a huge important part of the human rights agenda. But you don't do that by waiting until after breakfast. Um, because, in fact, we see development often is accentuated, accelerated in states where you do have a free press, where you don't have corruption, or we have people publicly fighting about corruption. Those are, again, the individual things that come out of a system that's rule-based, law-based, constitution-based. So I think we can get caught by saying either or. Again, I say both. They're, inter inter they're indivisible 
interrelated. You need to have civil and political rights to promote the economic side and vice versa. Our last questions here in the front row. Okay, so the question was whether, um, just uh, as uh, the question being the U.S. is at the forefront of human rights and how would uh, Professor Posner respond to the critique that it supports a state, the particular example given was Israel, uh, that is uh, violating rights? Um, the, uh, the question you raise, I'm going to answer, but also put it in a somewhat broader context. The United States has all kinds of relationships with governments um, that violate human rights. The challenge for me when I was in government was not to say, let's abandon relationship with governments that are allies where we do have shared interests, but to also not lose our values. My first week in office, my very first week, I went to Geneva to respond to the Goldstone Report, which was done at the UN, looking at uh, cast lead, the uh, Israeli incursion into Gaza in 2009. And there was a much, I was, at, Secretary Clinton said, write a two minute statement and it's gonna have to be cleared. I didn't even know what that meant. God, I found out in a hurry. 30 different agencies looked at it. Uh, there were seven different agencies in the Pentagon debating whether Gaza, what was going on in Gaza was an asymmetrical war. I finally wrote to all seven and said, you figure it out, we'll call it whatever you want. But I did come in with two sentences. I said, there are serious allegations made here of human rights violations. And if they're serious allegations, there has to be a sustained effort to address those violations. Somehow those two sentences remained. And I wound up going to Israel five times. I was the first assistant secretary on human rights to go to Israel to talk to the Israelis about human rights in the context of what was happening in Gaza. To be sure, the Israeli government then and today is doing things that I would regard as serious human rights violations. That doesn't mean to me that we abandon the relationship. And the thing I would say, whether it's Israel or Egypt or Saudi, or I could give you a long list, Turkey, um, we have a lot of countries where we have very serious challenges um, the key to what we ought to be doing, and what I'm afraid we're not now doing, is managing those relationships, mindful of the economic security concerns and interests, but at the same time being true to the principles of human rights. It can be done, it should be done, it needs to be done. I would say in the context of Israel and the Palestinians, it's in the interest both of the Israelis and the Palestinians to move from where they are now to a place where they respect each other's rights. And there are two states, in my judgment, that are uh, both allies of the United States and both respectful of each other. We have a long way to go. I don't believe we're near there, but we don't solve the security issue or the peace issue without dealing with the human rights issue.